Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast, made for women who want their healthiest years to be ahead of them, not behind them. Join your host, Courtney Townley, right now as she breaks down the fairy tale health story you have been chasing all of your life into sensible action steps and lasting change. Hello, my friends, and welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. This is your host, Courtney Townley. And as always, I'm so deeply grateful you're here. And I want to send a special thank you out to those of you who joined me for the Consistency Code Crash Course last week. There was so much energy throughout the event. We got tremendous feedback about the event. And an awful lot of you decided to join me inside of the Rumble and Rise community at the end of that event. So I'm really excited to get to know you in the coming months. Now, on day three of the Consistency Code Crash Course, I introduced the practice of organization as a part of the Consistency Code framework. Because let's face it, if you have the intention to improve any area of your life, but you don't have a strategy in place for exactly how you're going to do that, you're probably not going to make, make much traction or you're not gonna make much traction for very long. So one of the key skill sets that we specifically addressed last week was identifying the ways in which you are leaking time and the things that you are doing that actually help you to protect and conserve time. So the exercise was really identifying the difference between time wasters and time warriors. And the reason this exercise is so important, it probably goes without saying, but ladies, I am constantly hearing things like, I don't have time. I have too much to do. There's never enough time. I always run out of time. And we all have the same amount of time. But how we're utilizing our time and prioritizing our time is wildly different, which is why some people have a lot of success and some people don't. We have to learn how to manage our time well. And so this exercise is kind of the entry point of being able to do that. So what was so fascinating when participants engaged in this exercise is I asked people to leave a comment in our Facebook group about the things that were wasting their time. What did they identify as their time leaks? And maybe not surprising to you, The thing I heard over and over and over again was social media. People do not like the amount of time that they are spending on social media because it is costing them time in other areas that are more important to them. And this is also an issue that comes up a lot in coaching calls that I do with clients. Inevitably, At some point, with nearly every client I work with, we address social media use. Because people are often in a lot of integrity pain around social media. Remember, integrity pain is when our actions do not align with what we say we want for our life. So when we spend a lot of time mindlessly scrolling on social media, we aren't really in integrity with ourselves. Because we're wasting time, time that could be used towards things that actually allow us to be in integrity with ourselves. Now, I want you to know from the outset of this podcast, which if you haven't guessed yet, is going to be all about social media and our health. (laughs) But I want you to know from the outset that I personally rumble with social media a lot on a lot of different levels. First of all, I'm a woman living in modern day society. So just like you, I have used social media for connection, for information, to stay in touch with family and friends. But I'm also a business owner in modern day society, specifically an online business owner. And I have a lot of conflict internally about being an online business owner, specifically one that advocates for women's health, 
and simultaneously use a social media to press that message. Because I think it's a conflict of interest in a lot of ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. But I also want to say that I hugely wrestle with social media as a mother. My son is 11, going on 12 here in just a few weeks. And we're really getting into that age where we have more conversations about social media. My son does not have a cell phone. I do not plan on giving my son a cell phone until he's in high school. And that is really uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Because most of my son's friends have cell phones. And it's, you know, he sees everybody using cell phones. So if you're the mother of a child, I'm sure that this rumble is very familiar to you. Now, just backing up for a second to this business owner piece, part of my business model is that I run a membership, right? It's kind of the bread and butter of my business is Rumble and Rise. And part of that community is that I have a Facebook group. Four members who want to be a part of it, which interestingly, about 50% of my members do not elect to be in the Facebook group. So I have lots of members who don't use the Facebook group at all. But then I have a very enthusiastic group of people who do use it. And initially, I wasn't going to use a Facebook group at all as a part of my membership because of this social media dilemma (laughs) that I consistently have not resolved in my own head. So social media, I hear time and time again, is preventing women from spending time on the things they really want to be doing. And it's addictive. And it has a lot of mental health consequences. So it's, I feel conflicted to use it at all to advertise, to market, to build community, because it's kind of like being an advocate for not consuming sugar and then asking people to come into a candy store to get education about why sugar isn't good for us. So all this to say that I have not figured this out yet. But I do want you to know that as a business owner, I'm constantly rumbling with it. I've had many meetings and many conversations with my team about working on alternatives where we can create community without the use of social media. And I rack my brain a lot on marketing and business growth without the use of social media. So last week, a lot of you probably are aware that Facebook, which also owns Instagram, went down for about a day, right? It wasn't the entire day, but it was a good chunk of the day. It was on Monday. And we couldn't access these social media channels. And I got to tell you, I was really relieved. It opened a lot of bandwidth that day. I didn't have to worry about posting. I didn't have to worry about responding. There was just a weight lifted off of me, which really struck me and reminded me that it's high time we talk about social media and our health. So again, I'm not an expert on this issue. (laughs) I do not have it all figured out. But this problem warrants a lot more conversations about the issues and hopefully a lot more solutions will be offered out of those conversations. So this is just one of what I hope will be many conversations around social media and our health. So I think we should start by laying some foundation. For me personally, I do not believe that the tool is ever really the problem. The way that people use the tool the amount that they use the tool in and why they use the tool can be a problem. For example, sugar is not the problem. The way we use it, how much we use it, the reasons why we use it is the problem. 
A lot of people have learned to use sugar as a reward for everything in their life. They are constantly negotiating and rationalizing, eating it for every occasion. A lot of people eat sugar to manage their emotional landscape. This is not healthy. But sugar itself is not the problem. Same thing with alcohol. Alcohol is a substance. Alcohol is not the problem. Like sugar, we use it to celebrate. We use it to unwind, to detach, to numb out. Many people get in the habit of drinking multiple drinks every day, which of course comes at a cost to them the next day. We convince ourselves that we won't be any fun without alcohol. Everyone else is doing it, so why not me? And so we almost use it because we're pressuring ourselves out of the fear of missing out or the fear of not being all that much fun. I also hear a lot of arguments around like, like calorie counting or macros, that those, you know, they're, they're dangerous tools. They're not dangerous tools. They can be used in dangerous ways. Some people will use these tools as a form of control. They will obsess about them to the point of isolating and harming relationships and themselves. They will use these tools because they associate their worth with a particular body fat percentage. Again, I illustrate all of these things just to make it clear that social media is not the problem. The way we're using it, the dosage in which we're using it, and why we're using it is the problem. So people are using social media to fill up every moment of white space in their day. And a lot like alcohol, we have a fear of missing out. We have a deep desire for connection. We also have a really strong attachment to dopamine rewards. And social media, for all of these reasons, can become easily addictive, which I think probably everyone here has ha- listening to this episode has had some experience with. And when we are consistently using social media in mindless ways, we're distracting and avoiding other parts, we're distracting ourselves from and avoiding other parts of our life that would actually move us in a forward direction. Now, I do think it's really important to recognize that there's, of course, an upside to social media. It allows us to connect with people worldwide. In a time of COVID, a pandemic of social isolation, what a blessing it was to have access to something like social media. So we still felt that nurturing aspect of community, of staying connected. For many people, social media is a creative outlet, right? It allows them to to put their writing out into the world, their ideas out into the world, their art out into the world. It allows us quick access to information and inspiration and even research if you're following the right people. It allows us to explore new ideas, especially things like YouTube, right? Where you really get like these content rich videos. Now I'm not saying they're all content rich, (laughs) right? I'm not saying all things are created equal, but there, if you look, there is really good information on these channels. Social media allows us to take a stand for things that we believe in, give a voice to maybe spaces and places that don't really have a strong voice. And for businesses, social media can be a remarkable marketing tool. All that being said, too much of a good thing can deplete our health. This is true of food. It's true of, you know, sleep. (laughs) It's true of exercise. All these things are wonderful and so important for health. And used excessively, they can start depleting our health. So what that looks like specifically with social media is if we use it too often, 
We waste time and energy and mental bandwidth. Social media can harm our self-image because there's a lot out there that is misrepresenting real life, real aging, real weight, real health. Social media absolutely can be a huge player in disrupted sleep. I read something recently that teenagers are, you know, the average teenager is, t- is, is looking at social media 10 times a night. And we, we know through research how disruptive that blue light is to the brain, especially in the middle of the night. Social media is linked to depression. A lot of people play the compare and despair, the reality versus fantasy, right? All of this stuff comes up with social media. There's a lot of social anxiety because of social media. We feel like we should be doing all things all the time for all people. And we tend to start using it more and more and more. So for many people, social media has become an addiction, And let's just define what addiction is, because I think a lot of people, you know, feel uh, attacked by that word, and that is not the intention at all here. Addiction is an inability to stop using a substance or engaging in behavior, even though it is causing psychological and and physical harm. So there's all kinds of things we can be addicted to. Social media, of course, is one of them. Now, the average person spends nearly two hours a day on social media, which just quantitatively, I think it's really important to explore this, what that means in terms of our life. That amounts to five years and four months of a lifetime. So roughly five and a half years of your life, if you're an average user, is being wasted on social media. And again, I'm not saying that all of your time is wasted on social media, but let's be honest, a lot of it is. And here's the real kicker. For teens, which are absolutely by far using social media the most hours of the day, this is what research is showing us, they spend, they could spend up to nine hours every day on social media. I mean, that's like decades of a lifetime. And the craziest thing of all is multiple studies have found really strong links between heavy social media usage and an increased risk for depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, and even suicidal thoughts. Researching for this podcast today, I came across an article in U.S. World News Report written by a woman named Helen Buig, which, interestingly, she also is the founder and CEO of a foundation that is devoted to elevated critical thinking. It's called the Reboot Foundation. Anyway, the article is titled, Social Media is a Public Health Crisis. Let's Treat It Like One. And I just want to read you an excerpt from this article because I think it so eloquently (laughs) speaks to this dilemma that we're facing. She says this, more than half of people we surveyed acknowledged that their social media use intensified their feelings of anxiety, depression, or loneliness. They also told us that it contributed to their low self-esteem and made it harder for them to concentrate. Yet, despite recognizing these effects, only about a third say that they had taken steps to limit their social media use, such as deleting or suspending social media accounts, turning off their phones, or limiting time on their feeds. I find it incredible that even though users know the harm that social media is having on their mental health, they are unwilling or unable to limit their use of these platforms. It's a lot like smokers and their cigarettes. We should treat it that way. If every time you opened Instagram, you first saw a warning label like those found on cigarettes, 
Caution, social media may be hazardous to your mental health. Or when you logged into Facebook, you saw this. Warning, Facebook may increase feelings of depression or loneliness and suicidal thoughts. Or whenever you received a Twitter notification, this came with it. Warning, heavy social media use is linked to higher rates of depression and anxiety. End of the excerpt. So why are we so addicted? Well, there's lots of there's lots of intricacies we could probably dive into here. But I think one of the things that we I really want to highlight in this episode today is this false pleasure that social media rewards us with. So false pleasure is a concentrated pleasure. Like added sugar, right? White table sugar is a false pleasure. You get a lot of sugar in a concentrated amount, which radically alters your state of being, though temporarily, it alters it radically. And this is the case with social media. We temporarily feel way better. Dopamine, the pleasure-seeking hormone, right, is hugely rewarded when we use social media, especially when we're getting likes or social interaction because of the posting or the the communicating we're doing on these channels. And a lot of you have heard me in recent episodes reference Anna Lembecki's book, Dopamine Nation. I really think this should be required reading for every human in modern day society. So her book, Dopamine Nation, Finding Balance in the Age of Indulgence. And she does a remarkable job explaining how dopamine can really create addictive behavior. And there was a really fascinating article that she wrote in Wall Street Journal titled, Digital Addictions Are Drowning Us in Dopamine. And I just want to read you a section of this this article um, to explain how she describes the balance between pleasure and pain. So the excerpt says this. One of the most important discoveries in the field of neuroscience in the past 75 years is that pleasure and pain are processed in the same parts of the brain and that the brain tries hard to keep them in balance. Whenever it tips in one direction, it will try hard to restore the balance, which neuroscientists call homeostasis, by tipping in the other. As soon as dopamine is released, the brain adapts to it by reducing or down-regulating the number of dopamine receptors that are stimulated. This causes the brain to level out by tipping to the side of pain, which is why pleasure is usually followed by a feeling of hangover or come down. If we can wait long enough, that feeling passes and neutrality is restored but there's a natural tendency to counteract it by going back to the source of pleasure for another dose. If we keep this pattern up for hours every day, over weeks or months, the brain's set point for pleasure changes. Now, we need to keep playing the games, the video games. We need to keep checking our cell phone, not to feel pleasure but just to feel normal. As soon as we stop, we experience the universal symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance. Anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and mental preoccupation with usage, otherwise known as cravings. So I thought this was just a really brilliant passage to highlight in this episode for why we become so addicted to things like social media. It offers us pleasure, 
But the, the, the flip side of pleasure is our brain trying to create that homeostasis. So when we're done with the pleasure part, we're going to feel some pain. Now, it's not suffering, but it's a lot of discomfort. And if we don't have a practice of sitting with the discomfort, we just keep on seeking the pleasure. I also think there's a lot that feeds in to our addiction around social media. Number one, we use social media as a buffer. Anytime we're bored, anytime we don't want to be doing the thing that we're supposed to be on task with, social media is a really easy thing to turn to because it makes us feel better fast. So social media, we absolutely use as a buffer. We also... I think as a human race in modern day times, we are losing the art of emotional agility. Emotional agility is recognizing that all emotion is a part of the human experience. And if you really start to feel or believe that the human experience is only supposed to be happy and joy-filled and pleasurable all the time, you are going to chase a lot of false pleasures to accomplish that. So emotional agility, I've mentioned Susan David's book so many times, read it, it's called Emotional Agility, is really the practice of learning how to be with some discomfort so you can stay in integrity with yourself throughout your life. And here's the truth. Emotions are messengers that tell us a lot about the truth of our life. But if we, if emotions come and we are so quick to get rid of them, we don't really get to hear the messages that are being sent. We can't change our life based on those messages. So if every time you're uncomfortable, you reach for your phone to check, to scroll social media so you'll feel something better, you never, you really avoid resolving problems in your life. We are also largely out of practice with allowing urges. Now, if you're a longtime podcast listener, you've heard me talk about allowing urges before. And with social media, if you want to improve your relationship with it, you absolutely have to learn how to allow urges. And Doing a digital detox, right? Having set periods of the day where you absolutely do not allow yourself to go online is a really powerful part of allowing urges. Are you going to be uncomfortable? Yes. Are you going to have a craving to get on your phone? Yes. But if you just sit with those things, you don't answer them, they will pass. And the truth is you have urges to do all kinds of things every day that you don't gratify. I always use the example of somebody cutting you off in traffic. You might have kids in the car. There might be something really horrible you want to yell out the window, but you don't, right? Or somebody interrupts you in a meeting and you get really irritated, but and you could say something really horrible, but you don't. You allow urges in certain areas of your life. Why not with this? And also, I think social media seems so innocent because we've normalized it. Everybody's doing it. If everyone's doing it, it must be okay, right? And yet we all know the downside of social media because we've all experienced it. So how do we take our power back? I want to, I definitely want to wrap up with some tangible things that we can start addressing. And remember, this conversation is just scraping the surface. I realize that. But I did, you know, kind of have this, um, you know, the wheels started turning last week during the consistency code of, oh my gosh, I need to teach a course or something on the use of social media and how to take our power back. But here's some of the things I would teach if I ever taught that course. (laughs) Number one, we have to have a daily practice of reminding ourselves what is most important. What are your values? How do you want to be spending your time? How does social media fit into that value system? Does it fit into that value system? Because like I said at the beginning of this podcast today, I'm questioning really deeply if social media fits into my value system. Curate feeds 
to reflect those values. So if you determine that, yes, social media to some degree does fit into my, my value system, curate feeds that reflect that. Curate feeds that reflect your values. Do not let anything into that space, into your feed, that makes you feel terrible about yourself, makes you question how you've built your life in a way that doesn't feel productive. Be radically honest with yourself about how much you're using social media. There's lots of apps that will allow you to track your time on social media. I think even the iPhone has a built-in little mechanism that will tell you how much time you spent on social media for the week. Pay attention to those things. Don't just shove it under the rug. Don't just turn a blind eye to it. Well, you can. That's an adult choice. But if you want to improve your relationship with social media, you've got to be willing to look at that data. And then based on what you learn, set some boundaries. I think a really easy way to set boundaries with social media is to block time. Block time in the day where you are actually allowing yourself to use it. And be very specific. Why are you using it? What's the intention of using social media at that time? And how long are you allowing yourself to use it? And Anna Lembecki speaks a lot to the uh, self-finding techniques in her book around addictions. For example, I never knew this existed, but it makes a lot of sense. There's lock boxes that you can have in your kitchen for people who have certain food addictions or alcohol addictions. Um, you can lock these things away for periods of the day where you absolutely cannot override the code to get access to them. Now, I think in modern day society, everything has a workaround, right? Like if you couldn't get in the box, you could go out and buy it. But I do think there are self-binding experiments that are worth trying on. So I just actually bought a little box off Amazon that holds my cell phone. I type how long I want the phone to stay in that box. And I cannot open the box unless I break it. And I don't want to break it. I think I paid like 30 bucks for the thing. But that is one of the measures that I am using to stay true to my own values because I don't trust myself to not use my phone if it's in my vicinity. I've given my phone to my husband on weekends to like just, I just tell him I need to be away from the phone, just take it, hide it, and don't give it back to me until five o'clock tonight. And that's been awesome, super helpful, but my husband isn't always around right? He's not home during the workday when I'm working. And there are periods of the day where I don't want to be using my phone. I have an app on my phone called Opal, which is also a self-binding technique. I can write, type in how long I'm going to be working on a project. And for that period of time, let's just say it's two hours, I cannot check any apps on my phone. That's been immensely helpful. So what are things that you could do that would allow an extra layer of protection if you need it, which I would argue most people do <laughs> because I think a lot of us set the intention that we're not going to use the phone and then we do. Also learn how to allow urges. This is a big thing that we do inside of Rumble and Rise. We talk a lot about allowing urges, sitting with the discomfort of wanting something and not giving it to yourself and just trusting that that desire, that craving is going to pass. It always does. Are you willing to sit with the discomfort for a little bit of time? I think social media fasts are really powerful, right? Going for a weekend, a week, if you go on vacation and, you know, can be off social media for a longer period of time, even better. Because it reminds you, it becomes so glaringly obvious how much social media is taking your attention off the rest of your life. And I don't know of anyone who's ever taken a social media fast that didn't find it beneficial. And Anna Lembecki argues that it takes about 30 days for our brains to reset that sort of dopamine balancing point. So if you've been using social media a lot and you don't like your relationship with it, just stepping away for a day or a week, she would argue is not enough time. 
So again, I do not have this all figured out. I just wanted to open up the conversation because I know this is relevant for an awful lot of people. I am totally open to having experts on around social media, to having more conversations around our complicated relationship with social media, because I'm definitely invested in this conversation. I have a lot of interest in it for my own personal sanity, and even, like I said, for my business structure, all the things. So I hope something in here maybe just pivoted your thinking a little bit or you know, was useful to you in some way. And I always appreciate you being here. I hope you get off your phone for at least the next hour. (laughs) Go out, enjoy your life, um, and stay aware. Stay aware. Pay attention. I'll see you next week, my friends. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Grace and Grit podcast. It is time to mend the fabric of the female health story. And it starts with you taking radical responsibility for your own self-care. You are worth the effort. And with a little grace and grit, anything is possible. 